The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or CBGTV.com. You're watching the Cannabis Broadcasting Group here at CBGTV.com. Welcome to Green Crush. What does that mean, all the people say? Well, the green is cannabis, and what's getting crushed is cancer and laws and poor journalism and misconceptions and fairy tales. It's all getting crushed, and I was so happy today to get up and get on the train and come to downtown Toronto, the beautiful downtown Toronto day. It's, I know this because it's only about the fifth one we've had this, this summer. But I was so happy to get on the train and pick up the commuter paper. And here's the mayor of Toronto, John Tory, talking finally about uh, cannabis. He says he's looking at the length of time that it built to, that it takes to build the infrastructure, and it frustrates him immensely. He says we need the help now. He says we need the help now. We'll have to cut that out. We'll go back. We need the help now, he says. And he says there's a huge inertia that favors the status quo inside big organizations. And he says we have far too many people doing things with clipboards and pens. And then I realized, now he's not talking about cannabis legalization. He says he's getting impatient about how long it takes for transit. And getting help from the province. And he uses the same kinds of terms that cannabis patients and users have been using for a long time. We've also been looking at a length of time that's incredibly frustrating to get something that's free and available and grows in the ground and is also affected by photosynthesis. So thanks for coming out for once in a while, sunshine. And we need the help now, he says. He's waiting for the province, John Tory, the mayor of this city. He's waiting for the province to take action. And he's sick and tired of them not taking action. But there he is, presiding over Operation Claudia. And he says it's a huge inertia that favors the status quo inside big organizations. I have to agree. We have to get rid of people, <laughs> big organizations telling us what we can do. Organizations like the police chiefs of Canada and the labor unions and a lot of other people who would rightfully so lose their job. Don't you think? Don't you think a lot of jobs will disappear if cannabis becomes rightfully legal? We're going to talk about that. And a lot of other things on the Green Crush. Hello? It's the crush. Once again, I'd like to thank Legna Zeg for that song, The Reflection by Legna Zeg. That's the theme song of the show. We are broadcasting from downtown Toronto in the beautiful Pacific Junction Hotel. Come on in. Have something to drink, something cool, something tasty, something hot. They've got everything here. And we are broadcasting with the courtesy and abilities of Eggplant Digital Network. It's part of the Eggplant's digital creative content hub. That's a lot of things to say. And uh, today on the air, on there with us, we have the angriest pothead in Canada, Russell Barth. Russell, are you there? Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is where he's not there. Okay, so we heard in the theme song uh, some coughing. And we heard in the theme song uh, a lot of um, nose clearing. 
And now we're on to the actual um, show, and the guest is no longer with us. So thanks very much. Uh, Russell, we will have you back on as soon <laughs> As soon as you were available, we're not setting a good tone here today. I'm so sorry. Uh, we'll talk to Russell later. How about that? We will try to get Russell back on the air. I don't know what happened to him, but he is the angriest pothead in Canada. Um, you're telling me now I'm getting word. Now, this isn't the equipment. I mean, this is the equipment. This isn't anyone working it. I'm now getting word that he said, what happened? I'm here. I didn't do anything. And yet. Talking. Okay. It's this button here. Everything's brand new, folks. This is all um this is all okay. Russell, I'm going to start again. Don't say anything. We've been having trouble all morning with the tech. I wonder why that is. Are you there with us? I am. Oh, fantastic. Russell Barth, ladies and gentlemen, is the angriest pothead in Canada. The well, angriest. I try to be. He tries to be. He's laughing right now, but he has lots of reasons to be angry because he knows more about the situation than a lot of people. And uh, Russell, how are you in Ottawa today? What's happening there? Well, we're hot and sweaty. It's a very muggy day in Ottawa, uh, as it is across a lot of Ontario, I guess, right now. And um, some good things are happening here. Uh, I want to start off on a good note. Uh, for example, Cannabis Culture opened, um, and they're the only store in town that sells to people 19 and over without a prescription. And they have all kinds of nice pot and hash and shatter and things there. And they're doing a lot of business. And they got busted about uh, a little under two weeks after they opened. And they were open again in under 23 hours. And they haven't been bothered, and they haven't that, been bothered since. How does that happen? How, how do they disappear uh, for that long and then just come back right away? What do you have well, to do they, to turn things around? Well, they didn't disappear. Um I mean, to you get know, seized or, or, you know, you said they were. Well, busted. the cops, the cops came and um, they arrested everybody and they took everything. And then the next day, somebody came to the place and opened it and new people worked there. And they brought new pot <laughs> and they sold it to people. <laughs> and they've been doing that ever since. And everybody who got charged, you know, got out eventually and they're either facing charges or whatever. Uh, some of the people have had their charges dropped and stuff, but uh, but they're just chugging away. You know, they're doing lots and lots of business every day. We just, you know, they just went through the Canada, Canada Day weekend. Yeah. Where the whole downtown was just, you know, swarming with people. Um, so they just, you know, there was steady, steady business the whole time. And uh, they're going to be opening a second location soon. Okay, let me ask you this. In, in, in Toronto, they have Project Claudia or Operation Claudia. Yeah. What Do they have a similar uh, named... Uh, theme going on in Ottawa? Is there a different woman's name for every single one of these uh, clamps? I don't think they had a name for the bus. What they did was they, you know, the, the Ottawa police are always com complaining that they have limited resources, which I find fascinating because it's a wealthy town and we have one officer for every 504 citizens, which is one of the highest rates of police per capita in Canada. Um, crime has been going down every year, uh, according to their stats. We did have a little burst of uh, shootings going on, um, you know, last year. But even the police were saying it's mostly amongst themselves kind of shooting guys. It's not sort of, you know, by innocent bystanders and kids are getting hit by stray bullets as people drive around shooting. It's idiots trying to kill each other. So, um, so you know, crime is going down and everything. But th it seems what happens in Ottawa is they, they seem to – they take some time to check out the place and make sure that the place is doing what they think they're doing, selling pot to people. And then they decide whether or not they're going to bust them. Now, what's interesting is that the cannabis culture raids with Project Claudia and everything, you know, the Goodwins got busted, uh, Brittany Guerrero got busted, the Emery's got busted. And then I think it was the next day or the same day, cannabis culture in Ottawa got busted, but it wasn't part of Project Claudia. They didn't get swept up in the whole thing. It was a different bust that was done by the Ottawa police alone. So then that's, I guess, how they opened up the next day and stuff. So, uh, I mean, I don't know all the details of how they pull that off, but, you know, they just, they have the infrastructure and they're, they're ready to keep going. So there's a second location opening. Well, that, that's it with the infrastructure and they keep going, like you say. Like, how does, how does this even pan out? I mean, it seems like not enough people know or no one cares. But as I understand the situation, they have this operational net that they're saying they're going to arrest anybody, uh, you know, selling cannabis out of a dispensary because that's not what they want. And then they 
take all of the stuff, they take all of the goods, they arrest a lot of the people, but now it's turning out they're not even prosecuting these people. They're letting charges go. Uh, to me, if I were pressing the full extent of the law and I went into a dispensary as a police, uh, a police personnel, I would think I would also need to arrest the customers. But that's yeah. not been happening. And I'm not advocating the arrest of dispensary. Mm. Don't get angry. Yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, by rights, by the law, yeah. if you're arresting people for selling an illegal substance in an illegal store, the people inside there should also be getting charged, but they're not. They're letting the people they are getting busted go. Yeah. Why is this going on? It sounds like it's just a, it's a big shakedown. pot grab. It's just a shakedown. Like, does this have anything to do with the fact that once it becomes legal and there are enough uh, medical cannabis users sometime in, in the rosy future that they may not have enough cannabis uh, for those people, especially with the record? Well, I think what happens is they just take it, you know, they just confiscate it. I, I think there's a lot of factors at play. For the cops, I think they're in a position where they have to sort of look like they're enforcing the law. Because if they get a camera stuck in their face and a microphone stuck in their face, they're like, hey, man, there's 11 uh, dispensaries in town. Uh, what are the police doing about it? They're going to say, we don't care. We're not going to say that on camera, right? Now, when, when we had our uh, – Christine had a psychotic episode back on, in May. Christine's your wife. My wife, yeah. And, she, you know, she had an episode and the cops came. And, you know, they came running around my apartment because they, they had a report from one of the neighbors of shots fired because there was a noise that sounded like – probably sounded like shots fired from a distance. <clears throat> anyway, they came in and they looked around the whole place, not searching my stuff or ransacking it, but running around looking at everything. And at one point, the cop says, um, you know, he saw my dab rig and my dab stuff out. And he goes, OK, so all that hash oil, that's all. Uh, and I said, yeah, that's all mine legal. We have medical licenses. He goes, oh, OK, I don't care. We don't even care about that anymore. Yeah. So that's what that one. That's what that one officer said. But what and happens what, to all the stuff they do confiscate for places? What, what they do confiscate? Well, they put it in a lockup and then eventually <laughs> they destroy it. They'll put it into an incinerator or something. One joint at a time, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's what's supposed to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, as to what actually happens, I can't really speak to that. I've never really been inside the police station beyond the lobby. So, um, you know, I mean, the cops who came here, they were nice to us. Christine was freaking out, screaming nonsense, but they were very kind and gentle with both of us and, respectful. and respectful and everything. And um, so I guess they just take everything and they just confiscate it. Now as for the cash... I don't know. You'd have to ask the police what happens to the cash. I think maybe it gets absorbed into their funding somehow. Because um, I do know they have that sort of, um, you know, proceeds of crime stuff that they do where they, they you know, they pull somebody over for a, a taillight or whatever. They find that he's got a, a suitcase with $68,000 in bills. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to keep this. And the guy's like, no, it's my money. They're like, no, anybody who has that kind of money has a bank account. <laughs> and... Um, you know, this kind of stuff. So this, there's a lot of that going on. How much they took from, uh, you know, the Emery's and the Goodwins and everything, uh, I guess, is all in the uh, in the arrest records. Now, I think what's happening with the dispensaries and stuff in Ottawa, and this is totally a guess, is the cops go, well, who are the guys who are – they try to investigate what they can, and they find out who's affiliated with maybe some not-so-nice people. And if they can find a thread, this guy's connected to this guy who's also connected to this these bikers – Okay, we'll go after him. It makes for better press. It makes us look like we're doing our job. A reporter might say, okay, well, why not go bust all of them? And he's going to roll his eyes and go, are you, are you serious? Come on. There's like 17 of them in town. We bust them. They're going to be open the next day. We're going to bust them again. I mean, come on. You know, this will go on forever. But they have to look at they're doing something because if they actually say on camera or in a statement or anything, listen, uh, the law is up in the air. We don't really care. We got other things. To, we got bigger fish to fry. They're not going to say that. Because it's a PR nightmare. And they're not going to say, oh, well, these places are super dangerous and we hate them and we're going to crack down because then they look like a bunch of monsters. So they go, well, you know, we enforce the law. Our job is to enforce the law. Until the law changes, we're going to enforce it. So we're enforcing, we're investigating, we're investigating, we're enforcing. And then they, the reporters, instead of, you know, rolling their eyes and making a jerk off gesture at the camera, they're going, oh, well, uh, that's what the police say. So, you know. Gladys Kravitz is happy because she feels like something's being done. <laughs> and then the uh, and then the actual pot users in Ottawa are not too apprehensive because they're like, well, we're, we heard about a cluster of busts in sort of, you know, November through to March and then nothing. And like no, everybody's getting either offers to plead out or 
you know, they're just having their charges dropped or they're just saying, yeah, yeah, okay, time served. It's just all kinds of stupid stuff like that. And again, I'm not an advocate of, yeah, yeah, throw the book at these people. They broke the law, so they broke the law. But it does look kind of stupid when it's, you know, dispensaries busted or 11th, you know, 4th dispensary busted or whatever in the Ottawa Citizen and all this hyperbole about how they're illegal and they pose a safety to the community. But then then why are these people getting bail in like five hours kind of thing? You yeah. know, why are they getting their charges dropped? So it's, it shows the absurdity of it. And I have a real problem with absurdity. Um, I grew up in a situation where I felt like there was a lot of subterfuge, especially looking back, you know, people were lying to me, to each other, to you themselves in your, in your family situation. Yeah. In the family situation. Okay. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a horrible, horrible situation. I was, you know, well fed and well dressed and all this kind of stuff, but it just seemed that nobody was really ever telling the truth about anything. Right. So when something is absurd, you know, if somebody says, well, why can't we have, uh, you know, more solar panel panels and more solar stuff around the country? You go, well, there's all this infrastructure you got to build. Like somebody asked me, why, why don't we doing this with hemp? We need to grow all this, t- all the tons and tons of hemp, grow hemp everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Then what? Well, uh, right. Where do you, you cut it, right? You got to cut it. You got to put it and dry it, or you got to ship it when it's wet. That starts eating into the profits that you make from growing all this hemp because there's no infrastructure. So the point being if something hasn't got an infrastructure in place yet, you go, okay, well, we'll work on it. The problem with pot prohibition is it's very simple. Stop hitting people. Yeah. You know, it's very like you tell your brother, you tell your little kid, stop hitting your brother. And the kid is still sitting there punching the little brother going, I'm trying. It's very complicated how to not punch my brother. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, we really hope you'll stop punching your brother soon. Because he's hurting and say, well, I'm working on it. We have a task force examining the situation. The kid's still sitting there just punching away at his brother, right? This is what's happening to pot users in Canada. Now, granted, it seems the punches are getting softer and less frequent. There's only been 15,000 busts since Trudeau took powder, power, powder. Probably (laughs) powder too. Power. No, he doesn't look like a coker and all that guy. Not at all. He looks like he's in good health. He looks like he'd be too (laughs) snippy about that. I don't put that in my body. So, um, <laughs> you're getting mad at him cause he might be in good I, health. So that's, no, not yeah, well, yeah, I resent the guy because he grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth and it's been feeding him organic food. And you know, this is what bothers me. He doesn't know what it's like to be poor. He never knows. He doesn't know what it's like to worry about where his medicine's coming from. He doesn't know what it's like to worry about where his next meal or if he's going to make his rent or any of that stuff. You know, he's never had to worry about a damn thing in his life. Oh, his dad died, his brothers died. I mean, all the wealth in the world is not going to take make that feel okay when your parent when a dad dies or or a brother dies or something like that. So, okay, but in the meantime, the guy's had a pampered life, you know? Right. And well, I've been I, watching him grow up at the same time while I'm while I'm living my life, I'm watching him drive sports cars and be a drama teacher and all this kind of crap. You know, so this is why I resent the guy. But then, all right, fine. So he's in power. It's what you do with power when you get there. You know, he could have lived a whole silver spoon life his whole life, got into power and become the super coolest prime minister the world's ever seen. Not this neoliberal Harper light scumbag that we've come to know and hate. And that's what's what he is now. So that's very unfortunate. Well, tell me about that. Tell me about this. Uh. What you know about this? Did, were you aware of the uh, justice government, the justice.gov uh, website putting up a touring speaking schedule back in, uh, I think it was April? About the, um, no, I don't remember seeing that. <laughs> Great. So even you're watching things and you didn't see it. There was a well, there's tour. So much of it goes on. There was so much sp- of it goes on. And the, yeah, it was the a problem with any tour. of these government meetings, though, is every time they say, oh, yeah, yeah we're going to have a public thing. So then Ann McClellan or somebody, you know, Bill Blair comes to the town and, um, and then Christine, put the door. and then, and then, um, you know, they come to town and you think, okay, it's going to be like a big open thing where everybody gets to talk. No, it's them and like some local. Oh, did we lose them? Shoot. Sounds like we lost them. So I think he was about to... Well, it seems like he's still there. Ticking away here. What's going on? Oh, wow. Hey, that's the live stuff. You can't really do anything about it. It's kind of... uh, It does or doesn't happen. Gee whiz, it's it's still ticking away here like I'm actually speaking with Russell. But what I think he was about... What I think he was about to say... 
and what he was about to say are two different things, perhaps. But but uh, I was getting to the point. It sounded like Russell was going there also. And I mentioned this on the first broadcast last week that uh, the justice.gov website listed a speaking tour uh, across the country as to where uh, cannabis, uh, where they were going to be talking about it in the various cities across con- uh, across the country to explain the policy of the government and to hear feedback from the citizens. And then they didn't bother listing the um, the website. They, d- they didn't list the location of the speaking tours. They didn't have a website for that. They just had a, a website saying there was going to be a tour. And so uh, I don't know what's happened to Russell... <laughs> It's not Russell's fault. It's it's Skype again. Uh, thank you so much, Bill Gates, getting it together for us. We were told we could rely on this thing. All right, we'll have to get back to Russell. Uh... Oh, that's him officially leaving now. But meanwhile, I'm sure he was talking all the way through. There he is. Okay, we're back on the line with Russell. Hopefully, there he is. Are you there, sir? He is not, but he is. So somehow I don't have audio on this thing that's coming up. We don't know. Coming, hello? Oh, there you are. This is getting very strange. Okay, Russell, are you there? Leave, I am. Okay, let me let me just we say. Well, let yeah, me we just were... say what I said there while you were gone. Is what I said was while you were. It. You did hear it. I... Yes, and this is the thing. They didn't list publicly where these meetings were going to take place. Ah, so, so okay. it was like you couldn't go to these meetings. The public couldn't go to these meetings and go, hey, wait a minute. Because the only people they had at these meetings were Bill Blair, Ann McClellan, whoever else came from the, from the task force, and some local, you know, maybe an MPP, some local city councilors, this kind of stuff. That's it. Exactly. And, you know, other quote, we call them, quote, stakeholders, you know. <laughs> Like somebody from the church or somebody from the school board or not, none of the users, none of the patient care people, none of the actual dispensary owners or anything like this. So this is what's so disheartening about it is, you know, sometimes you get a friend on Facebook who goes, well, you know, they're starting some, at least that's good. And you go, no, it's not. It's not good. Go read the bill. It's actually worse than what we have now. Yeah, it's funny. You know, a, like I said at the beginning of the show, the mayor of Toronto is he's he's done waiting for transit money. Damn it, we need to move ahead. We're done waiting. He's okay on that front, but not when it's about life and death with people. Exactly. And the thing is, too, I mean, they keep hiding behind the oh safety thing. Well, we got to keep it away from teens and stuff. They know perfectly well these people aren't stupid. Okay, the task force is pointless. It was all theater, but they already know all this stuff, and they know perfectly well that nothing. Nothing is going to keep pot away from teenagers. If teenagers want pot, they'll get pot. They could put a vending machine full of pot in the high school, and it probably wouldn't do that well because the prices would be higher than the guy three lockers down. Okay, let's let's talk like about that. They could that not have more bit. access to pot than they do now. Okay, let, let's abs- talk about where they get it now. Then, where do kids? Well, where do kids? The kids that they're worried about. Where do they get it now? They probably just get it from older siblings or friends of older siblings. Okay, and they're saying that there's a direct line from that to to uh, the mob. Well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. What, are they, what are they concerned about? That a kid is going to get something in his hands he's not supposed to get? I think I think if I was a parent, here's what I would be concerned about in terms of kids using te- uh, you know teenagers using pot. My kid goes to a school, and the kid down a few lockers says, "Hey, man, you want to come smoke a joint with me?" And my kid's like, sure, okay, I'll go smoke that joint with you. And then he comes home stone, and you're like, okay, so you smoked a joint with your friend Billy there. That's fun. Where did Billy get it? Shrug, I don't know. <clears throat> what was in it? Did it taste funny? I don't know. Did it pop or crackle when it when it burned? Well, a little bit, yeah. Okay, so you don't even really know what it was you smoked, right? Uh, I don't know. This is the problem, okay? Right, yeah. So, so here's the thing. Now, people have been using pot for centuries or whatever, and even for the past hundred years under this prohibition – we haven't really been seeing a lot, you know, an epidemic of like weird lung infections or, you know, weird throat things happening or kids teeth falling out or whatever because they've been smoking pot. So although crap can be on the pot and it can be badly grown and not laced with anything, but just badly, badly grown, can contaminated is a better word than laced. Um, it hasn't killed anybody even in those circumstances. 
But these are the things you want to avoid if you're a teenage pot smoker, right? You want to avoid fungus. You want to avoid fungicides. You want to avoid bug carcasses and bug feces and, and you know, live funguses and fertilizer that hasn't been flushed out properly and all this kind of stuff. Because that's not going to make your pot any better. It's, you know, you're just, it's just doing harm. Even if it's doing a small amount of harm, it's still just doing harm. Is this, though, the wedge where the government gets involved and says, okay, on all of these points Russell just mentioned, that's why from now on this one company is going to provide uh, organically exactly. provided seeds, et cetera, and this is the cleaner you can use, and this is the uh, exactly. this is the antifungal we recommend, and so on. For- exactly. They just keep They're building to- these friggin' infrastructures of control. Right. Well, the thing is, that's that's good in a way because the big infrastructure of – large house grows like any of these big ones, Peace Naturals or, you know, uh, Broken Coast or any of these people, uh, seven acres, you know, they got a huge thing going on. Um, this is wanted and needed, just like with any kind of agriculture, right? So they're providing a service and it costs some money and it's going to cost so much per gram based on what it costs. Okay, but when people are growing in mass amounts like that, they have to do different things to control pesticides or to control pests and fungus and bugs and other, you know, maybe nutrient issues than they would if they were running a hundred plant grow in their garage or something right. or, a, or a 20 plant grow in their basement, right? When you catch a little bit of thrip or you catch some spider mites, there are things you can do that are sort of labor intensive and a bit cost intensive sometimes on the small scale. But you couldn't possibly do that. I mean, you're not going to get into a suit and start spraying milk all over a thousand plants. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? That's not going to work out too well. So you have to get some sort of something like mycobutanil, but not mycobutanil. So um, they have to do this. Now, if the problem is if you've got thousands of plants or tens of thousands of plants and you've you know caught a whiff of something that you don't want in your product, like happened with Metrum, well, uh, you know, if you're trying right. to get away from a fungus and you've so got all these plants to provide, okay, and but if you could say, well, scrap it. When people are growing, you know, scrap the whole thing. That's just, we'll just burn money. What the hell? Or you take a risk. You risk that maybe microscopic amounts of something is not supposed to be there is going to be in your product and you hopefully you won't get caught and you push forward. I'm not accusing Metrum of anything. I'm just saying if you're a huge company like that, the incentive to break the rules is much, much greater. Well, that's than the same with pork or any kind of anybody in the meat business, anything high exactly. volume that needs exactly. uh, decency you, inspection. Exactly. Now, if you're, if you're going to grow, you know, if you're going to have 10 pigs in the back of your small farm for yourself, or you're going to give one, you know, when come slaughter time, you're going to give one to your mom or, you know, to the, to the family or next door or whatever, that's one thing. Buyer beware. But if you're going to want to take those, those pigs to market, well, someone's going to be coming to inspect your facility. You see? Yeah. That, I think, is good. Because a lot of people have, have become You have to know sick. the shit's not in there. Well, exactly. I mean, yeah. this is what I've... And I was mentioning this on John Oakley's show sometimes, is it's good to know that it's coming from company X or company Y because you can go, okay, I'm going to go look at their website and see what their growing protocols are. So let me ask you this. So that, I, don't wanna, of, I don't want to pick on anybody yet. Uh, There are certainly plenty of targets for that. We'll get to it through the course of the show. But I I wanted to understand, and I thought we would get to this a little bit later, but we're getting to it now. Without going too heavy on on blame or anything like that, can you please describe uh, what happened at Metrum? Metrum is a company, a cannabis-associated company, and they are are pretty large. And tell us what happened there. Well, their product was tested and it was found to contain trace amounts of a banned pesticide called mycobutanil and mycobutanil is perfectly safe and it's used on uh things like grapevines for you know wine and grapes and stuff like that mm-hmm. and if it's put on those plants to control a certain fungus and it gets on those on the fruit or whatever and it's washed and you get trace amounts in the food it's okay because when it goes into your gut it's processed through the gut, it's neutralized, and it presents zero harm to the body in these trace amounts. However, they do not know, and they suspect that it's quite bad to be 
vaporizing, as in heating them up until it volatizes, or indeed combusting it and inhaling the smoke from any product that may have had micro, microbutanol on it, i.e. tobacco, cloves, or cannabis. So if you had a vineyard... What was the second one? Cloves, like, you know, smoking clove cigarettes. Oh, clove kind of cigarettes, right. Like okay. anything you might sure. want to smoke, right? Okay. So, you know, smoking cloves is neither here nor there, but you don't want microbutanol on it to stop any, you know, fungus you might have had in your little garden. So Metrum was found to have this stuff on it in some of their product. So they recalled their product and they scratched their head going, well, we don't actually buy anything with microbutanol in it as far as we know. But then this guy came forward and he alleges that somebody brought some in. And then when the Health Canada inspectors came, these bottles of microbutanol were hidden above ceiling tiles in one of the offices. Say that again. <laughs> somebody, somebody alleges yeah. that another person at Metrum hid bottles of microbutanol, a banned uh, fungicide, and they hid them in the ceiling tiles of an office okay. when the Health Canada's inspectors came. Okay. So, I mean, that's about as ethical as, you know, picking up a popsicle off the sidewalk and selling it to a child. So, um, now, there are possibilities when you can buy a product and then you think, well, it's the same as this other product we bought and you accidentally find that there's some microbutanil in it. These things can happen. This is not apparently what happened. And we'll probably never know exactly what happened because they said, yeah, yeah, we sorted it out. And then Canopy swallowed Metrum up just as this was happening. They oh. were already in the process of buying the company when Metrum had this happen. So they just like, oosh, and they just bought them anyway. And they'll deal so, with it later. Well, Canopy is absorbing the, the impact of this. So they had a giant product recall. And then Michael Butenhill was found in other products from other companies, but they don't have the accusations of having hidden bottles anywhere or anything like this. It's still kind of a mystery. And the problem is that Health Canada seems to be, up until that point anyway, were a lot more diligent about do you have enough security and do you have enough cameras and is there enough barbed wire and crocodiles in the moat around your facility. They didn't seem to care too, too much about if the product that was being produced was that clean or useful. Um, you know, they want to make sure there's no diversion. They want to make sure that every gram is accounted for because, you know, one gram gets out the back door or slipping down in somebody's pocket cuff. God knows how many kids could die from that. So they're really, they seemed really strict and diligent about all that stuff. But when it came to um, quality control, they weren't able to really, uh, you know, meet muster. So since that happened, Health Canada's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've hired some more people for sure. And then they've also apparently hired more people for the offices to process paperwork so that they'd only take 13 weeks to process instead of 19. Different topic. Why is it that everybody wants to sell, not everybody, but a lot of people are pushing for cannabis sales to be sold through LCBO, what's known as the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. I'm sure various provinces uh, all have their different ways to distribute alcohol, the corner store in Quebec. Uh, but what do we have uh, in the way of people wanting to get that done? Why is that well, good it seems, or bad? Well, um, on one hand, I think pot should be sold any place. I think they should be allowed to sell it at the LCBO. They should also be allowed to sell it at the supermarket and the corner store. And I think it should be sold to people 16 and over just to keep everybody happy. But Let's be realistic. Everybody's going to get a hold of it if they want to or not. Um, the thing with the, I think there's a handful of people, mainly the LCBO <laughs> and some government people who are friends with those LCBO people who want to have exclusive rights like they have with booze. But let's take a look at the LCBO model. Well, now we have booze in supermarkets. We have booze in, in corner stores and all this kind of stuff. So maybe the LCBO model is not so bad. On the other hand, I think what some people are proposing is an LCBO-like place. So it would be, you know, the, the Cannabis Control Board of Ontario, CCBO, and it would be green with a pot leaf on the thing, and, you know, and you'd go right. there and it would be like, it would basically be like cannabis culture here in Ottawa or like the other cannabis culture stores. Yes, what can I do for you? Well, I'm interested in some hashish today. Well, here's the display. What kind of, right. you know, the rubber gloves, you smell it a little bit. Okay, I'll break you off a piece. That's $25. Have a nice day, sir. Yes, can I help you? Right, but on a large scale. Um, you know, if the government wants to have a, a chain of stores doing that, fine. But they cannot exclude 
the little guy. They cannot exclude the mom and pops. We will not stand for it. You know, but not to mention that if the LCBO goes on strike, as they once again threatened before Canada Day, that wouldn't be any kind of <laughs> reasonable proposition for a medical user. Well, no, exactly. For medical users, that would be out of the question. For medical users, what I would propose, if I was in, if I was sitting as an MPP, I get up and I'd say, "Listen, guys, how about we favor the not-for-profit model?" And everyone goes derp, and I say, "Listen." Everybody who works at the garden, everybody who works at the facility, everybody who works in processing, they all get paid at home, you know, a good wage, a living wage. But it's a not-for-profit organization, so the prices stay low, low, low for the patient. Then the government can pay for that medical marijuana the way we pay for other prescriptions for people on ODSP and other health insurance coverage that people have in Ontario and in Canada – The prices stay low for the patient, the prices stay low for the insurer, the prices stay low for the taxpayer, and everybody's happy. Recreational, we regulate that, open stores, people sell whatever they want to sell at their prices, it's let the free market decide. That's what I would do with the the, uh, medical dispensaries, is make them not for profit. Okay, well, that sounds uh, that sounds like an interesting position. Maybe you should go to one of these town hall meetings that are in uh, high secret and offer mm-hmm. that uh, information to them. Yeah, the problem with starting a not for profit dispensary now is um, because of the supply chain. That's the issue, right? You can't sort of say, oh, you know, you can't just have grower X <laughs> in the in the box where you purchased that pound of weed or that. You know, those ounces of shatter or whatever. Right. You have to have actual business numbers from your people you buy from to make the books clean. Tell us real quick about having a plant. A lot of people are going to want to start having plants because it's soon going to be something that we're allowed to have. So there's people that have had plants for a long time. But then there's the swaying, uh, the folks that sit on the fence, and they're currently saying, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. It's illegal. And then as soon as it becomes illegal, they'll say, ah, you know what? I might try that. There's a, yeah, there's a well, big Or soon it becomes legal, yeah. So I think what's going to happen is we're going to see What's the best thing? Well, I think if people want to grow at home, they need to understand – the number one thing you want to do is be courteous. Courteous means you don't want to make any smells and you don't want to make any problems of any kind for your neighbors. So let's say you've got a little bungalow and you've got a little bit of lawn around it and your neighbors are like right next door. You can hear his phone ring, right? He's that close. Yeah. You don't want to be putting your four plants or a bunch of plants or whatever in your backyard stinking the place up. For example, where I live now, we just moved here in February, I've got a really nice balcony. It faces due south. It would be perfect for growing pot. Just absolutely perfect. The thing is, the balcony is one long balcony with a metal partition that separates us from the neighbor's balcony and their balcony door. So if I had pot plants out there, there would be all this pot stink going into their window. They have a newborn baby there. (laughs) So that would not be cool. You know, that would not be a courteous way to be. And, um, you know, when we're here, we mostly vaporize. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. You're basically Um, saying don't be an asshole, but how do we legislate that? And and it's funny. Well, it's funny that we have to legislate it because apparently Canadians don't know how to do that anymore. Because, uh, you know, it needs to be legislated and regulated apparently because people don't know not to light up a joint or a cigarette in a crowd. People don't know uh, not to, you know, they don't know to get some charcoal filters so that the neighbors can't smell everything in your house and your house stinks like pot all the time. There are people growing and the whole house stinks. And you're like, dude, your whole house stinks. And they shrug like, oh, I barely notice it anymore. It's like, well, it's not good. You can't, it's not a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. So people, if anybody's out there listening now and they think they want to grow, man, there's websites, there's YouTube videos, how to grow properly. You want to grow four plants? Here's how to manage four plants. Now, don't don't go, you know, getting your cart ready yet to hook up to the horse because I don't think this bill is going to pass. Okay, that's what we're going to close on, Russell. We're almost out of time with you, and I want to, that's really nice the way you brought that in. So we have this yeah. pending legislation. We've had some changes. We've had some people weighing in. Give me a quick timeline. It was supposed to be set up soon after the election, and then let's just say uh, yeah. April 20th on 2016, Notice- right? 
But notice the timeline. They could have started this right away, but they started it later, well into Trudeau's uh, administration, right? Yeah. Now, there's a good chance, I've seen articles, there's a chance it could be, it's almost definitely going to be scuttled by the Senate if it makes it to the Senate because it might not pass the House because they might prorogue. Now, there's not a big reason for them to prorogue because they have a majority, but we can almost guarantee, you know what I mean? We can almost guarantee it's not going to get past the Senate because the way the, the conservatives were talking in the House of Commons about this, they make it sound like all hell's going to break loose. So we already know it's not going to pass the Senate. So what I suspect is going to happen is it'll go to the Senate. The Senate will send it back and say, well, we don't want, you know, there's all these unconstitutional provisions about plants and, and the safety and a bunch of crap will come back because it's conservatives. They'll just pull something out of their butts. And then they'll give it. They'll give it back. To, well, I mean, rather than giving actual cogent, um, no, critiques, I know, I know. Just, they'll just go. Oh, it's little Johnny might use the toaster oven, so you got to have a, a locked steel door on their thing. You know, all kinds of stupid crap like that. So we fast forward to, to the, the house. The, go ahead. It'll get sent back to the house. Trudeau and his minions will harumph about it, and then they'll they'll um, not reintroduce it and then they'll talk about it in the next election and go, well, yeah, we tried to legalize pot. All these companies are getting their LP licenses. All this stuff's going on, man. We tried and uh, it got scuttled by the Senate. So reelect me. I'm Mr. Fabulous. I'll put some of my people in the Senate. We'll have this bill through lickety split in another year and a half or so. Let us finish the job because, hey, if you vote for the conservatives, this all this thing we started might just fall apart. You know, they say they're not going to take all the LPs down, but you know the conservatives, you can't trust them. So it's going to be a blackmail election. Marijuana, half, that, it, half of that's true. Like, the conservatives will tear it apart, right? I mean, no, 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 the conservatives probably won't. That's just it. You think they'll let it go through? They let, Well, no, not the legalization, but they're going to let the LPs keep growing and they're going to let the uh, ACMPR keep chugging away because they don't want to do anything big one way or the other with that because they saw how it blew up in Harper's face. So if, they're, if they have any brain cells left um, in, the, in the Tory party, there it is. if they have any brain cells left, they're going to um, just leave it and let it sort of keep going the way it's going. As for the legalization for recreational purposes, they'll never do that. And they'll campaign on a fact. No way we're doing that. No, absolutely not. Never. So we're in a different place completely if and when this bill doesn't go through the way you say. So we'll, we'll right. be, we'll and be sitting the bill there and drift. Through. Right, right. And we're screwed either way because if the bill does go through, all the more reason to protest because this bill, if it passes, is worse than what we have now. Because what we have now, the police have limited sort of jurisdiction to enforce if they get this new bill they have 45 different ways they can bust you now they only have eight well you knew they were going to get involved because if you took a an illegal substance and all of a sudden made it legal spreadsheet wise excel spreadsheet wise paperwork wise budgetarily speaking you don't need that many police you just You're right so they've made up a whole thing where they're saying well we have all these new regulations there's going to be more enforcement and this is why municipalities and provinces are like, oh, my God, the federals are talking about legalizing pot, but who's going to pay for all this enforcement? Yeah. You know, but at the same time, I don't think that enforcement is actually going to happen. Well, we'll have to see. We'll leave it because, right there, Russell. We'll, we'll all leave, right. Because give me the because. OK, give me the because. Because um, <laughs> this is all going to fall apart in courts. Everything in Canada falls apart in the courts. And there are court cases that are pending that are going to keep chipping away at the CDSA. Eventually, that tower is going to fall and the whole castle that we've been trying to siege will be ours. And the lodestone there is still the Parker ruling of 2000. Is the that Parker right? ruling. Exactly. That is, that's the lodestone. Exactly. And we've been chipping away and chipping away and they keep propping this tower up and propping this tower up with sticks and other things. And we keep bombarding it. And one day we're going to get the big, the big catapult and uh, the right case is going to happen and the right ruling is going to come down and that's just going to be it. They'll have no way to scramble and put it back together. So since we're talking about 17 years there since the Parker ruling, give us your best encapsulation of it in 30 seconds and we'll talk to you again. Status quo for another two and a half to three years. Hassles with the cops for another 15. Oh man, that's an ugly uh, prediction. Yep. Uh, I, I agree with that, but I, I wanted you to just go back and encapsulate what the Parker ruling means that they oh, keep what the Parker ignoring. ruling means. Oh, the Parker ruling is simple. Um, the uh, judge ruled in 1999 that until such time as the government put forth a workable medical access program, the CDSA was uh, 
of was null and void. It was of no force and effect as it pertains to cannabis, not all the drugs. But they can't just do this overnight. So the, the judge says, you got one year to sort this out. One year later, summer of 2000, the, ju- the government gives us the MMAR. And they go, there, there's the medical access regulations. That means the prohibition stays in place, right? Right? Everybody's happy? Right away. That was sued. And, and 10 court cases later, it's been ruled, the CDSA is still ruled unconstitutional. So as far as I am concerned, as far as many other people are concerned in the way I live my life, pot is as legal as the air I'm breathing. It has not been regulated and I can do whatever the hell I like. Sounds good. That's a good place to leave it, Russell. Listen, we'll be back in touch with you again. I'm sure that uh, the twists and turns of this saga are going to uh, are going to be pretty crazy as we get closer to either legalization or an admission that there won't be. Prohibition 2.0. Prohibition 2.0. At least when the booze came back into it, it came back into it, you know? There's another way you can't compare. Well, it's funny because they're, they're talking on the news. They're going, on one hand, well, we've got to protect Canadians from this substance. That's why we're regulating it. And then the next article two days later is, when pot's legal, there won't be anywhere near enough to go around <laughs> because the demand is so high for this drug that Canadians demanded that we be protected from. Yeah. It's absurd. It, the whole thing is so freaking absurd and this is what freaks me out and gets me so angry and typing things horrible horrible things at tweeting at the prime minister so <laughs> <laughs> okay well i'm not going to be the reason you get arrested on this show because we're going to want to talk to you again later so russell thanks for being there and thanks for uh, having me fighting the good fight it's the angriest pothead in canada everybody russell Barr. thanks a lot russell and there he goes that's uh that's a guy that knows uh, a lot of things the hard way that's why I like Russell. Russell knows things uh, because he is a uh, he's a medical user, and so is his wife. And um, they probably wouldn't be around without it. I know that's uh, where I was in a state of I wasn't going to be around without it, but I didn't know about it, and then it just kind of hit me like a well, some kind of informational wave a thought it was probably a prayer or a screaming out for help while i was in the emergency room but i i'd like to spend a little time on this article from 2009 this is just one article of a hundred articles that i'm going to read today i'm going to read 100 articles (laughs) no i'm not really going to do that i just wanted to see how long it was going to take russell to to drool on the board He's going to read a hundred articles. Yeah. So this one is from 2009. I, I mentioned it last week briefly. It's from August 2009. How many years ago is that, right? That's a lot of time, eh, Russell? What were you doing nine years ago, eight years ago? You weren't, you weren't reading this, that's for sure. You're a young guy. This is great for you. You can go crack one off into a tube later and find out how viable you are. Uh, because if you are in trouble, I can help you out with this, with this particular green crush. Listen to this. Active chemicals in cannabis have been shown to halt prostate cancer growth, according to research published in the British Journal of Cancer today. That's what it says from 2009. I I don't understand how it is that an article like that can even be out in the world, floating around on the Internet from cancer research uk.uk cancer research uk.org is what it's from cancer research.org cannabis chemicals stop prostate ca- you know what's interesting about this particular article if you read things on the internet there's a lot of may and there's a lot of might and could and has been shown to and those kinds of couching words you know normally you'd expect to see cannabis chemicals have been shown to provide an opportunity to slow things down. No, it goes right to it stops prostate cancer growth. So I really want you to know about it. Here it is again, cancerresearchuk.org, which is kind of funny because it looks like cancer research, Chuck. That's what it is, really. But it's cannabis chemicals stop prostate cancer. What are those chemicals? Well, sometimes... It depends on the kind of cancer that anybody has, but in prostate cancer specifically, you do have um, you do have terpenes that are effectively battling things. You have uh, uh, 
What's the other thing that's in there? Oh, yeah, the thing everyone gets upset about. THC is in there. People always try to scale down the amount of the THC. They say, well, give me that, but I, you know, I don't really want to experience any kind of um, unsettling after effect. And then they'll hop right into a chemo table. Um, so I don't know why that is, why, why people shun uh, this information when it comes up. But more importantly, I don't understand why people working in the medical field shun this information when it comes up. I'll probably refer to it again, but let's, let's go to this article one more time. Researchers from the University of Alcala in Madrid tested the effects of the active chemicals in cannabis called cannabinoids on three human prostate cancer cell lines, PC3, DUA45, no I don't, and LNCAP, which are my initials. The prostate cancer cells carry molecular garages called receptors in which cannabinoids can park. That's another reason I like this particular article. The scientists showed for the first time that if cannabinoids park on a receptor called CB2, the cancer cells stop multiplying. How does an article like this get out into the world and at the same time so many people believe there's nothing you can do about cancer? I don't understand that. I mean, we are told this every day about cancer. There are so many different ways to get cancer that I don't know how I got it. I don't. I wasn't, uh, I used to smoke cigarettes, but it's hard to think that after 14 years of not smoking, it's going to be prostate cancer that takes me down after that. So it could be, but I don't know. Uh, you won't know either. A lot of times, unless you're a, a, a chimney smoker, um, you won't know why exactly you got cancer. It'll be hard to figure it out. Some people blame themselves. Other people uh, take that blame on and um, turn it into a me, me, me trip and, and say, you know, oh, if only I hadn't driven by that pie shop where you stopped to get that. You know, and there's a big story about how it's not really connected. Uh, but here's something that's kind of scary. We've just got a few minutes left on the show, but uh, a Harvard study, I'm going to be leaning as hard to the mainstream as I can for all the folks that can't take, um, you know, a lot of people get upset if it isn't the main news of CNN or ABC or what have you. But this is a, a study from Harvard saying the vasectomy is linked to aggressive prostate cancer, a Harvard study. Men who have a vasectomy may be increasing their risk of prostate cancer. How about that? That's a really uh, terrible, ironic twist. Uh, I know a lot of guys try to uh, get a vasectomy because they want to be able to be sexually active and uh, they don't want to have any more kids. And... Uh, Let's hope that's not what's actually contributing. But these doctors say that men who have a vasectomy may be increasing their, see, there it is, may be increasing their risk of prostate cancer and more specifically developing an advanced lethal form of the disease. I didn't know there was such a thing. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, no, I knew there was such a thing. I don't think it needs to be lethal but here we go again this article just came out relatively recently although what's july 11th 2014 so it's like five years after the fact of the previous article that says uh cannabis chemicals stop prostate cancer growth let's see that on the side of a bus no one's putting that out there Cannabis chemicals stop prostate cancer growth. Let's get that lit up on the side of the CN Tower. And instead of arresting people and places that sell this medicine that can actually stop cancer growth. Maybe instead of arresting those people and writing articles where you may contract a disease from maybe doing something, how would you even begin to prove that a vasectomy <laughs> would cause cancer? I don't know. I don't want to get into the studies of that. Uh, the Harvard School of Public Health scientists are adding the heightened risk is small. 
and experts in the field not involved in the large-scale study say more research needs to be done to prop up the findings. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to do the research to find out what the findings are rather than propping up the findings of maybe, able to, etc.? He says, this guy here, what's his name? Um, I'll get it in a minute. Here we go. Dr. Louis Cavusi, chairman of urology at North Shore LLJ Health System, told CBS News, again mainstream, I would be cautious about applying these findings to clinical practice right now. This is not like cigarette smoking causing a large number of people to develop lung cancer. This is a small increase in the risk of prostate cancer. So if you just had the SNP, Keep an eye on things, and if it gets a little nutty, remember this, as we, we are going to fade out shortly uh, uh, on the crush for this week. It's gone by so quickly. There's so much more to get to. Let me encapsulate things for just a moment here. Um, the green crush is the wave of cannabis that can and is taking out cancer. <laughs> Okay, so that is what's going on with cancer. It's being crushed by the green. And the green is also the money, and the things getting crushed are also the laws, and hopefully also just the plain ignorance of, and I don't mean that in a bad way, ignorance like you're stupid. It's ignorance in a way of, hey, I didn't know that. So I, I'd like to come up with a quick little summation for all of the show every single time. A little catchphrase, a little something. I've heard a few things thrown my way. Uh, but it really comes down to knowing that there is a fourth door for cancer. And you can get yourself to the fifth stage of cancer. And when people say, well, I didn't realize there was a fifth stage that's the stage where you're still living. And stage four is behind you. And you definitely want to put stage four behind you. Okay, whether it was caused by a vasectomy or smoking or whatever it was. You have an endocannabinoid system in your body. Right now, I'm going to venture that it's not topped up enough. So what you need to do is ingest some cannabinoids for your system try being a vegan and getting through without b12 it doesn't go very well it's the same thing with cannabis folks it's the reason i'm here it's the reason we're doing the show i know it's hard to believe uh i spent a couple of years realizing how hard it was to believe before i realized it's actually true and you can go tell people it's been a bit of a stunner and uh but i'm awake to it now and i'm happy to bring you the news We'll be back next week on Green Crush with all kinds of cool things and a fascinating character or two to speak with. Understand this plant is life and can save yours. We are the Cannabis Broadcasting Group here at CBGTV.com.